our service. our holy Lord, who made the heavens and the earth, the earth being filled with his glory, let us bow down and confess that he is Lord in this place.
Good morning, everybody, um, here and at home. Um, there was a notice up on the board about the movie night. Um, if you wanted to come along, if you could sign up in the main room on the sheet and just um, highlight whether you want a meat or a vegetable pasty, please. <laughs> um, and then that just leaves me to hand over to Jan. Thank you, Jan. We meet to hear, share, and celebrate the holy word of God in the Bible. Let us praise God who inspired all who wrote down these words and inspires us as we hear them today. We join together to praise God as we sing hymn number 463. To God be the glory, great things he has done. Praise you, great God, for your act of creation, making life from nothing, for creating every variety of plant and animal, for raising up mountains and spreading out seas, for making us in your image and sustaining our lives. We praise you, wise God, for your covenant made with your people, for your guiding of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for the preaching of the prophets and the poetry of the psalmist. We praise you, loving God, for the coming of your Son, Jesus, 
for his humble birth and patient life and teaching and healing, for his death on the cross and rising from the grave, for his ascension into heaven and continuing life. We praise you, caring God, for the pouring of the Spirit on the disciples, for their gradual comprehension of your saving word, for the missionary zeal of Paul, for the writers of the letters and the revelation of John. We praise you, eternal God, for all who have passed on your words and deeds in the Bible and for those who were inspired to record their knowledge for those who treasured and translated your holy word, for those who have shared the message with us. We praise you for the gift of the Bible and all it means to us today. Amen. We're now going to take the offering. May the money we offer today and that which we spend in other ways be used to your glory. May the time we spend in prayer and meditation and the time we use in our many activities be used to your glory. May our homes and our lives be used to your glory. Amen. I think the little ones are going to leave us now. I've got a sneak preview of what you're going to do. So. Everyone else might be wishing they were coming with you. But. Do you remember when we used to celebrate Bible Sunday on the second Sunday of Advent? And we always kept it quite religiously. Now Bible Sunday's moved to the earlier in the year and sometimes we miss it out altogether. But Bible Sunday is celebrated on the last Sunday in October. And this morning we thank God for the Bible. Let us pray. We thank you for the Bible and its insights into your ways with us, gracious God. We thank you for its inspiring stories and its account of humbling failures, for its chronicle of new hope and restoration, and its history of the bumbling and stumbling of your people on the road to truth. We thank you for people of faith and courage along the way, channels of your grace, inspiring others by speaking your word of challenge and change. Above all, we thank you for Christ, the light of our world, embodying your initiative of love, proclaiming your offer of forgiveness, and calling us to share his cross-bound road We pray that we will respond wholeheartedly in Jesus' name. When we read the Bible out of habit, rather than with loving eagerness, for closed book and closed mind, forgive us, Lord. 
when we read the Bible without understanding. It's a closed book and closed mind. Forgive us, Lord. When we read the Bible seeking comfort without judgment. It's a closed book and closed mind. Forgive us, Lord. When we read the Bible seeking joy without discipline. It's a closed book and closed mind. Forgive us, Lord. When we read the Bible seeking forgiveness without renewal. It's a closed book and closed mind. Forgive us, Lord. Help us so to read that the Spirit may open our minds and lives to your word for each one of us. Great God, we cannot hope fully to comprehend you. For your ways are higher than our ways. Your thoughts above our thoughts. Your words give comfort when we're sad, encouragement when we're disheartened, inspiration when we're empty of ideas, instructions when we need to learn. And for this, we thank you. Help us to read, note and understand all that is written for us in the Bible and accepting your forgiveness and trusting in your love to find true life. Amen. The Bible is a very complex document. Essentially, it's a library. It's made up of different books with different styles and different authors. It'll certainly be read differently by different people. In the world of literature, there is disagreement as to whether William Shakespeare wrote all, or any, of the plays ascribed to him. There is, however, general agreement that all the plays were written by a human being to be read by other human beings. With the Bible, we can't say that quite so readily. Many people believe the Bible contains the divine word of God. Admittedly written down by human beings, but essentially God's message to humanity. There's a very old story that the Gospel of Matthew was dictated to Matthew the tax collector by an angel standing by his right ear. Matthew simply had to write down the words. Some people believe that the whole of the Bible was taken down like di dictation. There are other Jews and Christians who consider the Bible to be a very special book, indeed a holy book, but who would not consider it contains the actual words of God. It's rather a human interpretation of God's message, inspired rather than dictated. Other people might consider the Bible to be merely a book with no greater message than that of Shakespeare or Dickens. Who is reading the Bible will determine the manner in which it is read. The purpose of reading the Bible will effect, affect how it's read. It will be read differently in public worship from how it's read in private devotion. It will be read differently as a description of how God appeared in the past from how it's read to learn God's message for the present and for the future. We often describe the Bible as the Word of God. We believe that not only does the Bible relate to what happened thousands of years ago, but that it speaks to our generation, to our situation, times and fashions unimaginable when the words were written down. The Bible is not just a history book. When it's used in the context of religious life, it's a living text. It must speak to us now. Whenever the Bible is read, there is a new audience, an audience bringing with it its own context. But the Bible is often called on to make value judgments in social situations. This process must be treated with caution. In the past, the Bible has been used to support slavery, apartheid, anti-Semitism, 
and many other abusive and immoral practices. In the story of the temptations of Jesus, even the devil can quote scripture. It's impossible to claim to have an objective interpretation of a text, one single valid interpretation. But we don't need to go to the opposite extreme and claim that every possible inter interpretation is valid. A Bible that can mean anything means nothing. There are some interpretations that simply will not do. Any interpretation of the text must conform with the spirit of the text as well as the words used. Our character and the questions we ask will to some extent dictate the answers we receive from the text. Reading the Bible involves the responsibility of using the text in a proper manner to encourage discussion and debate, not to engender prejudice and bigotry. Because we believe in Jesus Christ, because we have seen in him what God is really like, God with a human face, we must read the Bible in a way that's consistent with what we know of him. If the Bible is to speak to us today, to our situation, then we must read it in the light of Jesus. Thus we cannot use it to bring division, or defend hatred, or promote war. We must use it to make unity, to, to encourage love even between enemies, and to advance the cause of peace. We sing hymn number 471. For your holy book we thank you and for all who served you well. So how well do you know the Bible? Yeah? You reckon you know the Bible? 
I've got some objects that I'm going to show you that represent either a person or a story from the Bible. And I want you to tell me what they represent. So we start in Act 1. This is what we call the Old Testament. Come on. Adam and Eve. Okay. There we go. Noah. Yeah, you're good at this, you see. I've got a book of dreams. Joseph. So many things in this bag. Can't find what I'm looking for. I know it's in here. There we are. It's a frog. It's a plague. Yes, a plague of frogs. And I've got a tent peg. There's a judges. There's a very, very gory story of what JL does with a tent peg and the man who attacks her. So that's Judges 4, if you want to go home and have a look at that. <laughs> and I've got a can of golden syrup. That's right, yeah. So on the can it says, there's a picture of a lion with bees coming out of it, out of the strong came forth sweetness. Who's that about? It's a riddle. Yes, Samson, that's right. That's Judges 14. I suppose this could be several, but, but who is the most famous king in the Old Testament? David. And I've got a cloak. Yeah, it's not really a curtain, it's a cloak. Although it's from the nativity box, it's actually Old Testament today. Who gives his cloak to someone else? Elijah. I think we might stop Jill answering these questions. No, you're good. Okay, last Old Testament... Jonah, that's right. Nick, I think your dad probably made that. <laughs> okay. Act two. You perhaps can't quite see that. It's Mary. Yes, it's Mary. I couldn't, I couldn't get any locusts. <laughs> well, actually, I didn't want to find any locusts, to be honest. So, locusts and wild honey, who would that be? John the Baptist. This is a story rather than a person. Parable of the sower, yeah. I knew you'd say Judas. I was thinking of Matthew or Zacchaeus, the tax collectors, but yes, they are silver pieces, so could well be Judas. I don't know if there's 30, I haven't counted. (laughs) 
Who was given the keys to the kingdom? Peter. Yeah. What occasion? Palm Sunday. Yeah, Palm Sunday. Yeah, Jesus, really. Yep, yep. Can you see that? It's quite small. What's he wearing? Armour. Where does it talk about the armour of God? Can you remember? Ephesians, yes. You're very good at this. Last one. Did you, I don't know if you did Bible Month, but it's, it's Revelation, the, the dragon in Revelation. Yeah, very good. And we sing hymn number 29. Thou whose almighty word chaos and darkness heard and took their flight. On Bible Sunday, we really need to look at the Bible. The Bible Society suggests that we look at a passage from the book of Nehemiah. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah belong to the period of national restoration after the return of the exiles to the land of Israel and the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. If you read Nehemiah, you'll learn that he was part of the exiled nation to Babylon. He had never been to Jerusalem, but in many ways it felt like home. 
when his brother comes to visit him and asks him about Jerusalem, he learns that the temple is still standing, but the walls and the gates have been damaged by fire. He doesn't know what to do or say. He stops eating and weeps for Jerusalem. He prays, but he doesn't have the right words. He holds out his arms as if he's saying, God, look what's going on. How can I serve you and your people? It wasn't a quick prayer. He thought it like that for days. He realizes it's to be his job to rebuild the walls that protect the city. He sets off for Jerusalem, carries out an inspection of the walls, and despite strong opposition, completes the task of rebuilding the walls. He is a forceful and highly practical man. He holds strong opinions, and some might find him arrogant, but he gets the job done. The huge job only takes him and his team 52 days. The passage we're going to hear is the next step in the restoration process, the public reading and the interpretation of the law for the whole community. The period of crisis has been a time of looking to past resources to find future inspiration. In this process, the law was preserved and shaped into the five books of Moses that make up the Pentateuch, the first five books of our Bible. The reading of the law by Ezra shows how the traditions are brought to life. On the day that became New Year's Day, the book is opened. So I'm sorry for whoever's reading this. There's a lot of complicated names. From Ezra, chapter 8 and verses... Sorry, it's near... Yes, you're right, it's Nehemiah. Chapter 8, verses 1 to 11. All the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So, on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra, the teacher of the law, stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him on his right stood Mathithiah, Shemaiah, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, Masai, and on his left were Pediah, Mishael, Malikai, Hashem, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshalem. <coughs> Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above him, and as he opened it, all the people stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbethai, Hodiah, Messiah, Keleta, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, and Peliah instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, 
Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for this is a holy day. Do not grieve. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Nehemiah and the priests had pre prepared carefully for this event. They provided a wooden platform for Ezra to stand on so he could be seen. They made sure everyone was there. The whole event had been planned as a centerpiece for the foundation of this renewed community. It was built around God's word. And they all listened attentively for about six hours. How do we Center God's word in our worship today. Do we plan carefully and study hard? Are we attentive to his word? The Levites gave an oral tr translation of God's law and explained it so that the people could understand. There was good reason for this because this was a complex audience there were those who had become zealous for their faith in the hostile environment of the Babylonian Empire. When they were in exile, their everyday language would have changed to Aramaic, but the law was written in Hebrew, so it was translated and explained to them. Those who had remained in Jerusalem had been left behind, leaderless. Perhaps there was friction between the different groups. They all needed to hear God's word for them. When the people heard what the law required, they were so moved they began to cry. They were struck by the gap between what they ought to have been and what they were. And they grieved at how they had fallen short. But Nehemiah and Ezra Tell them not to be obsessed with their sin, but rather to enjoy and celebrate what the Lord has done for them. God's word convicts us of our sin, but much more, it brings grace and the knowledge of love and forgiveness. This passage reminds us that we learn from the Bible, but we must also study the Bible and discuss what we learn with others. God's word has a dramatic effect. It has the power to change minds and to change hearts. It's central to understanding of our place in the world and how we should love, live and love. And that's a cause to celebrate. Amen. Amen. We sing... The Splendor of the King.
The reading from Nehemiah reminds us that there are lots of characters in the drama of the Bible that we don't remember. In fact, there are many, many people in God's story whose names we don't know. Of course, the story's not over. There's an Act 3. And we are the cast for Act 3. Think about the people of the Bible. And think about the church. Which character are you? Are you a leader? Do you like telling good news to people? Do you enjoy taking care of things or taking care of people? Do you like writing about the things that go on around you? Are you adventurous or are you more reflective? All sorts of people make up God's story. Can we have the Colossians for them, please? This reading is from Colossians 3, verses 12 to 17. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against somebody forgive as the lord forgave you and over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity let the peace of christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all the wisdom through psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Colossians tells us the kind of character God wants us to develop. We're meant to be compassionate, kind, humble, gentle, patient, tolerant, forgiving and loving. Then whatever role God has for us, whatever he wants us to do, we'll be able to do it. We come to church. We read the Bible. We pray to find out what, God, what role God wants us to play. And as we learn more about him and begin to walk in his way, we're beginning to get into our part in God's drama. So the story continues. Where have you seen God at work this week? I invite you to come and share with us. So I was at the meeting place this week working and a lady came in. She was obviously very distressed. I mean, re really, really distressed. And she asked to speak to somebody and I got voted that that was me. Um, I came out from the kitchen and she just threw her arms around me and hugged me. I've never seen her before in my life. And we went and sat in one of the huts and she was beside, I mean, she was traumatized. She was beside herself. And she said, I've come here before and I just feel that I can be safe here. And um, I asked her if she had a faith in a nice, gentle way. And she said, no, I don't. Um, and I asked her if she wanted me to pray with her. And she said she didn't, but that she'd be happy for me to pray for her. So I said that I would pray for her. Um, but she didn't want it to happen there and then. And what she said was anything, anything that might make things better. And although she said she doesn't have a faith, she actually said she was a scientist. Um, and yeah, but whatever happened that day, I do absolutely believe that God brought her to the meeting place and that I, off I said about <coughs> church and, you know, that, 
we were here every Sunday <laughs> and it would be a safe place for her because she feels very, very vulnerable. And um, whether she might come one day, I don't know. But if she does, that would be amazing. But God is definitely at work with that lady. And I just hope that she does hear that and feel that so that she can be at peace. We bring our prayers for the world. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we thank you on this day for the Bible, for the comfort it has brought to the sorrowful, for the guidance offered to the bewildered, for the gracious promises to the uncertain, for the strength given to the weak and for its progressive revelation of you. We pray for those who need to hear your words of comfort and strength and encouragement at this time. We thank you for the people of God who speak to us still from its pages and for the people of God whose learning has made those pages live. We pray for prophets, preachers and teachers who make you real for us. We thank you that it reveals to us your Son, the Word made flesh. Help us to read and to learn so that your, your word may indeed be a lamp for our feet and a light for our path. We remember the work of the Bible Society, the work of translation, of printing, of delivering the Bible to so many different parts of the world. We pray that our reading of the Bible will encourage us to do your work in the world and to herald in your kingdom. We pray for those parts of the world in great need at this time. For Israel and Palestine, Ukraine and Russia. For the families of those killed in the shooting in Maine. And all those affected by Hurricane Otis in Mexico. We pray for those closer to home who are discriminated against, for victims of racial abuse, for those suffering domestic violence, for those who are bullied at school and at work, and all who are not accepted as they are. And we pray for ourselves. We pray that in every aspect of our church life, we may express the richness of God's message. We pray that in every aspect of our mission to our community, we may enact the compassion and care of Christ. We pray that in all our conversations, we may display the wisdom of Christ. And that through our living, we may contribute to the developing drama of God's word. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
Our final hymn is number 465. We have a gospel to proclaim. Good news for all throughout the earth. God, you are the playwright of creation. You spoke and created galaxies and every living thing. Jesus, your living word, lived on earth and filled people with hope. He healed people and set them free and gathered volunteers to take part in the drama of bringing heaven to earth. May we go from here now and follow him and play whatever part you have for us in the power of your Holy Spirit and the blessing of God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.